Happy New Year. It is 2024. Well, when I'm filming it, it is not 2024, but it's nearly 2024. Uh, as my last few videos have probably made apparent again, like new job, new situation, trying to make videos when I can. So I had the best of intentions of doing separate videos for worst of, best of, priorities, but that didn't happen. And I don't really feel like breaking it up because I like really the only reason to break it up is like for views <laughs> and I just, whatever. <laughs> That's not really why I have a YouTube channel. I, I just do this for, for funsies. Anyway, um, so yeah, to, today we're gonna do them all. <laughs> so I, I thought it would actually be kind of cool to do them all together. Like it actually does make kind of sense in addition to just being also because I need to. Um, <laughs> so like on the, on that little like cusp night before day of, um, to do, to wrap up the old year and to then set plans for the new year. So that's what we're doing today. Um, I've got 10 best of, 10 worst of for 2023. And then as last year, I had my priorities uh, list and then I ended up vlogging me reading those priorities. Um, I basically wanted to do that again for 2024 because that worked out pretty well. I mean, I'm not gonna say that I liked the books <laughs> that I read uh, for that project necessarily. Um, if you watched the vlog, then you know that I very much did not. But that's not, I mean, I, I also, some of my favorites of the year were also from that project, so it wasn't all bad. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Um, couple, I guess a few disclaimers. I don't know if disclaimer is the right word. I did a ton of rereading this year. Um, which made it a little bit difficult, frankly, to this uh, kind of one of the reasons that um, mostly it was time. But I was also like, oh man, like I reread so much. Like, what did I even read this year? And I, when I do like the books a lot that I picked for my best of, don't get me wrong. But when I thought back on the year, other years I've been like, well, obviously this is going on, but let's see what else I read. Um, and there wasn't a single book really that came to mind as like, oh, well, this, obviously. And I felt a little bad about that because when I looked at what I had read this year, there were some really good books. But my overall impression of 2023 as a reading year is like not very great. Because <laughs> uh, again, a lot of it was rereading, which I do like to do. But when it's so much as rereads, it does feel like I'm not actually reading anything, um, if that makes sense. Because I'm not like um, encountering new stories. So when I look back on 2023, I'm like, oh, what are these like new favorites of mine? I'm like, well, mostly I was just rereading stuff. <laughs> I definitely also overextended myself. I, uh, both like by agreeing to other people's ideas and projects and my own and just a bunch of things. Um, I just had too many things going on that just didn't make it fun. <laughs> so I was constantly like reading stuff that I had was for some obligation that I had signed myself up for slash Half the time those obligations were rereads. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so I read a total of 128 books in, is that true? <laughs> I wrote it down. Yeah, I read 128 books as of right now. Tonight I could read two more and make it 130, but I probably won't do that. Um, but of those 128, 37, nearly 40 of them were rereads. So do you see how I feel like, I feel like yeah, I, I read a lot, but like, it felt like, you know, two steps forward, one step back, two steps forward, one step back, where not that rereading is a step back, but you know what? It doesn't feel like progress towards anything. Um, and they weren't rereads because of me being like, oh, you know what I really feel like reading right now? I'm really just like dying to read the first law, which is always true. But instead they were rereads that were for like read-alongs and buddy reads and projects and things like that. Um, so yeah, um, I'm really ex I was been I've been the happiest reading I think in the last couple months because I was mostly finished with those obligations, um, or I had given up on them. <laughs> Looking at you, year of Damon. In the last couple months, the majority of my like reading months have been new reads, and that has been great. <laughs> anyway, okay, all that to say, I did um, I originally was gonna give myself permission to use rereads on my worst of and best of, I didn't end up needing to, but I almost did that. And it was kind of close. <laughs> Cause originally it was, I was gonna allow myself to choose it for best of, but not for worst of. But then I was like, actually, I didn't actually like all of my rereads. I could do some rereads for worst of. <laughs> but um, anyway, no, everything on my best of and worst of is new read, new to me. And then obviously my priorities for 2024 are all new. With all of that out of the way, um, I, I've in the past I've done best, worst, best, worst, best, worst, like as like a back and forth type thing. Um, I did not rank them. I cannot rank them or I cannot be arsed to rank them, but I just also don't think that I could. So it's just 10 and 10. They're not like in ascending order of 
greatness <laughs> or anything like that. They're just 10 books uh, in no particular order. Um, and because I'm also doing my priorities, I think that's a positive thing. So I will start with best of books, then we'll do uh, negativity and do worst of books, and then we'll end positive again with priorities for 2024. And that's like a kind of compliment sandwich approach to <laughs> my reading. All right, finally done with announcements and things. Let's do, what did I say first? Best, best of the year. So again, in no particular order, these are not like 10th to 1st or anything like that. Um, if you saw, I did do a clip for Library of a Viking when he asked booktubers to uh, film a clip sharing their favorite book of the year. I did pick one for that and I guess if I had to rank these, I guess that one would be at the top, but yeah. <laughs> okay, so first, just because it's the top of my stack, no particular order, uh, is Lud in the Mist by Hope Merleys, um, which was actually towards the beginning of the year. I chose this um, for a uh, for for the Blades and Bodice Rivers book club, um, which we are doing again in 2024, where we dress up. Uh, me, myself, me, myself, uh, me, <laughs> Mara from Book of Legwo, uh, Bethany from Beautifully Book of Bethany, and Amanda from The Naughty Librarian. Um, so this is my pick, and... Um, to I can confess now because I don't know I still kind of want to do it but I didn't um this is originally intended to be part of a vlog project um that I didn't get around to making much progress on in 2023 and so originally I chose it because I was like well I would like to choose it for book club plus it'll like knock out one of the books for my vlog project and um and then yeah I didn't end up being able to finish that. So I, I still kind of want to do that vlog project and I might include this one in it even though it will have maybe I'll reread it. I don't know. Um, I might still want to do that vlog project so I won't say what it is because I like to keep them kind of a surprise. But anyway <laughs> this book um, this is um, a pre-Tolkienian fantasy um, and it is it was a cited as an inspiration both for Neil Gaiman writing Stardust and for Susanna Clarke writing Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. And for both of those reasons, I was very interested in reading this. Actually, for all three of those reasons, because reading pre-Tolkien fantasy, it's like, did fantasy exist before Tolkien? Is that allowed? <laughs> and I do really love Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, and I like Stardust. I don't love it. And reading this, as I said in my Stardust video and in book club meeting for this, made me like Stardust better because instead of Stardust just being a book by itself that is just like, eh, um, I still don't think it's that good and it's certainly a pale imitation of this, but it made me kind of appreciate like what it was that Neil Gaiman was kind of in conversation with and what he was deriving inspiration from. So seeing it as a, not really a retelling of this, but you know, as like a kind of successor to this is makes Stardust better. So if you've read Stardust and you were not that keen on it, but it's a story that like, you feel you ought to have been keen on, if that makes sense, um, then I highly recommend Lead in the Mist. And also if you like Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell, I also highly recommend Lead in the Mist. Um, I made um, Book Born read this as well for our TBR swap and she enjoyed it. I think this is a pretty good, uh, actually, I'm not, I don't think I ever read this little blurb. I don't know how I missed it. I don't know who Mary Gentle is, but she says, a Shakespearean tragicomedy, a murder mystery, and a multifaceted allegory all in one, and a damn good story too. Um, and I would fully endorse that description of this book. So it's older, um, the so the prose in it is a little bit more verbose, a little more formal, and therefore a little bit harder to like get into, but not harder than reading any classic, frankly. Um, so, you know, if you're reading Rebecca by Daphne du Maurier, that's a little bit more verbose than something written nowadays. Um, just like, you know, I mean, Tolkien is that way as well. So um, if you're willing to sit down and kind of like, take a minute to digest the sentences. Um, and then after that, I think you kind of get a flow, at least I did, um, reading it. I, you know, once you kind of get into the headspace of wordier sentences that are more formal, I feel like it gets faster. Anyway, I really, really enjoyed this. Obviously, it's in my top 10. <laughs> then finally, at long last, I did finish reading The Greenbone Saga, Jade Legacy by Fonda Lee. I did read this brick um, because it was on my priorities for the year. My patrons picked it for me to vlog for them and that ended up being a two-parter because I, because it was so long. So they ended up getting like, I think in total, like three hours of vlog for this. And yeah, this, uh, what an ending. Greenbone Saga Man. My, I think when in the um, priorities vlog where I also had a clip about this, my, it, my complaint, if any, is that because this spans so many years to wrap up the story, that there is a bit of like time skipping that is 
kind of takes you out of the flow a bit and doesn't really allow you to kind of like linger on some of the more dramatic moments because we have to move on to the next time skip. So you don't really get to see a lot of the kind of ramifications in the short term after something cataclysmic has happened because now it's five years later and you get a recap of what they ended up, how they ended up kind of like recovering from the last bombshell. But you don't have to like see that recovery. It's just like by the way, that's kind of how they handled it. I personally would have preferred this because I don't think this book could possibly be any longer and that'd be reasonable. So I would be have been fine with the Green Mode Saga being four books instead of three to give this a little bit more breathing room. But that being said, um, it wasn't, I still gave it five stars. Um, so pacing is like really the only complaint that I had about it. And for something that had to cover so very much, I think it still did a pretty good job. Like the pacing, wasn't as good as the previous two. But if like the assignment is you have to get through the story in this one book, you cannot have two books, then if that is the like requirement, then I think it was done as well as that could possibly be done, if that makes sense. So yeah, The Green Mouth Saga, one of my favorite series now, and I probably will reread it. It is still so unique, so different from everything else out there. Jade City remains, I think, my favorite installment in terms of reading experience, but all three, five stars each, just, an absolutely amazing series. And this is the book that I did um, pick for my favorite of the year for that clip. Um, and that is Citadel of the Autark. I don't have a volume of it that is by itself, only in bind ups. I have the Folio Society editions that are also bind ups and then these editions which are bind ups. So I'm not choosing Sword and Citadel. I mean, I'm, I'm choosing, well, yeah, I'm not choosing Sword and Citadel, which is the name of the bind up, but I'm not choosing Sword of the Lictor, which is the first book in this bind up. I am choosing Citadel of the Autark which is the fourth and final-ish book in the Book of the New Sun. The Book of the New Sun, which like I have a video covering this, is supposed to be four books, um, which is what is contained in these kind of bind ups. But he did end up writing Earth of the New Sun as a coda after that. And whether or not you count the story as complete before that or after that is a matter of discussion. <laughs> um, I think I gave each of the installments in this uh, quartet um, four stars until Citadel of the Autark and I gave that five stars. Um, and I think that as a whole, the Book of the New Sun is five stars. But each of the installments kind of each had a thing in it that kind of made me want to dock at a star until the last one. Because I really feel like the last one sticks the landing in a way that I can en don't envision it being satisfying for every person reading it. But if you're kind of into the project that is the project of these books, um, if you're down for that, then I wouldn't say the, I wouldn't like it to neatly tie a bow on everything, but I think in terms of what it's been building towards and how it's been written, I think the final installment is as conclusive as it was ever going to be. And the way it still leaves a ton of room for questions without being necessarily an open-ended ending, because um, those can be frustrating as well. And there's certainly books where I'm like, well, I know it's better to leave it open-ended, but it's so frustrating to get to that point. And I feel like a book that is able to both be a conclusion and leave enough kind of open where it's not like, you know, roll credits, you know, um, leaves some things still not fully explained, leaves enough for you to kind of like see where this would continue without it feeling like bait for a sequel. Um, I think the first law does this really, really well. I think Last Argument of Kings does that really well where it it's a conclusive ending that still has open-ended bits. Yeah, I just, I think this is certainly not for everybody, this series at all in general. Um, but I think if you are down for this project, I think it's well worth a read. And I think that you are, if you're worried about whether or not it's worth it to read through this, like if it's going to go somewhere that's satisfying, I personally feel that it is quite satisfying. It is my favorite installment in the four. Oh, if you don't know what this is at all, which I'm kind of assuming you do, it's a dying earth uh, story. Um, that was written um, in the style of supposedly in this far future, this is the memoir of a person living in this far future that was for timey-wimey reasons like um, this manuscript was received by Gene Wolfe who is able to translate it into our present day speech because language has changed a lot, you know, in the thousands of years that betwixt our time and, and their time. So Gene Wolfe has translated this far future manuscript for us so there's like multiple layers of how reliable this narrative is because it is a memoir, which is inherently kind of unreliable from a time and place that we don't fully understand what we have no context for that is being kind of like translated for us from a 
perhaps unreliable translator. <laughs> so I think it's a fascinating project and I think it's exceedingly well done. Not an easy read for many reasons, but I think it's worth it. Then a more uh, recent read is Parable of the Sower by Octavia Butler, which my patrons chose for me to read. And I really, really enjoyed this. Octavia Butler is three for three. Each of her books that I've read has had something in it for me to be like, uh, it's not perfect. <laughs> so I've not, I think I've given them all five stars, four, definitely four stars possibly five stars um, for all three. But it's never been like, a, oh, that was five stars, no question, no complaint, that was perfect. It's always been like, that bothered me, but still five stars, or that bothered me, almost five stars, had to give it four, you know, like, but still fantastic. Like there hasn't been a weak one in the bunch, really. There's just always been like a little bit of a something in the books to make me go, well, not that bit, or I wish that was a little different or something like that. So I really, really enjoyed Parable of the Sower. I had originally intended this to be my first Octavia Butler and then it didn't <laughs> end up being my first or my second. I certainly want to read Parable of the Talents. I have some reservations just because I know this is an incomplete series. So I, it kind of, I don't know. I, I know people, I don't feel that way about King Killer or Song of Ice and Fire. Maybe it's because the authors are still alive, so there's always the chance that they could be finished. But I often say that I don't care if it ever is finished, or I shouldn't say I don't care, but like, I don't think that should affect your choice whether or not to read it. I think it's worthwhile to read what's there. So weirdly for this series, I feel more so a kind of like, well, it's not finished. So these ideas are never gonna like fully be, you know, come to whatever that she had envisioned. Um, but I, just, I do still want to read Parable of the Talents. Um, and this was something about Octavia Butler's writing, all three books. It's just so digestible. It's so readable. This harrowing content in all three books, but it just goes down so smooth and easy. I think in my vlog for, um, for this book, I compared it to like a really strong cocktail that's done a really good job of masking the flavor of alcohol, where you can just like swallow it really fast and then it hits and you're like, whoa, that was strong. <laughs> But it wasn't like hard to get it down, <laughs> if that makes sense. But it's strong content. Um, I hope that metaphor makes sense. Anyway, again, it's on my top 10, so I do recommend it. Uh, next, perhaps controversially, is uh, Fool's Assassin by Robin Hobb. Uh, notably, this is on my top 10, but no other Robin Hobb, meaning that the books two and three in the Fits and the Fool series are not <laughs> on this list because I think that the series, this trilogy peaked at book one. I unpopularly have a great deal of issues with the ending of this trilogy and therefore the ending of the Realm of the Elderlings, which I've talked about quite a bit, especially um, in our sort of like wrap up um, live show, me and Mara, because we read the whole Realm of the Elderlings together. But I still highly recommend the Realm of the Elderlings. And I love Robin Hobb's writing and I love these stories and I love these characters. Um, I just have very particular issues <laughs> with certain kinds of stories and ideas and certain kinds of choices and etc. and certain kind of narratives. And they're very oftentimes things that don't bother anyone else that don't even aren't even the things that don't bother people. There are things that people like that I actively dislike. So I'm by no means like representative of the majority <laughs> when I say that I dislike the ending. I think most people do love the ending, um, or at least if they don't love it, it, I don't think it's for the same reasons that I don't. Anyway, this first book in this trilogy, I gobbled it up, devoured it, like swallowed it in a day and was like, Mara, Mara, we cannot wait a month to read the next one. And she read it, she was like, okay, yeah, no, we need to read immediately. <laughs> so this first book, it was so unexpected and so, I mean, it's book, what, 13, 12, 13 in, the, in this series. So it's kind of hard to say what it is or what's going on without being spoilery. It is, it somehow manages to be both like cozy in the way that Robin Hobb's books often can be, while still like heart-wrenching, heartwarming, um, heart racing, um, just such strange things that I didn't like, didn't expect, didn't, wasn't on my bingo card for this to be in a book at all, let alone in this book. It was fantastic. Possibly my favorite book in the whole realm of the Elderlings, although I think that honor still goes to Royal Assassin, but so very, very good. Um, that's why it's in my top 10. Next is an extremely recent read very recent. And that is Winter Spirits, Ghostly Tales for Frosty Nights, which is a anthology of ghost stories for Christmas. And I have always, ever since learning of it, <laughs> loved that idea and wished that we still kind of did that. Um, the idea, the tradition of telling ghost stories at Christmas, which is like why the Christmas Carol exists. Like that's part of that tradition. So that's like the only one that we still do. And it's not even like a particularly scary one. It's more of a heartwarming one. 
but like uh, the woman in black, I think the framing device for that is that it's being told at Christmas as a ghost story. I love the idea of like Christmas Eve, everyone around the fire telling ghost stories. Anyway, that's neither here nor there. This is an anthology and I found it actually because I loved the binding and the betrayals by Bridget Collins. So I was just looking to see if there were other Bridget Collins books. And this popped up because she is one of the authors that contributed to this collection. And um, when I saw that, I was like, well, who else? I'm not going to buy a collection just because of her one story. Who else is in it? And there were other authors here that um, I was familiar with slash liked. Um, so Katriana Ward, um, uh, Kieran Millwood Hargrave, Natasha Pulley, Stuart Turton. Anyway, there were other authors that um, I liked and was interested in. So I got the collection and honestly, the weakest story in the bunch was Bridget Collins. The entire reason that I found this and got this. Um, so that was kind of surprising and disappointing. But frankly, every single other story was really good to really great. There really wasn't a weak story in the bunch except for Bridget Collins story, which again, is kind of surprising. But for an anthology, for there to really be only be one story that was kind of a letdown, amazing. So I really enjoyed reading this in December. They are, uh, they kind of um, span from a little bit kind of unsettling to like quite unsettling. And I basically every single story, again, except for Bridget Collins, um, left me wanting more, but not in like a negative way. Not in like a, well, this would have been better if it was longer. Just like I was so invested in the vibe and, and it like with any like collection of stories, I do feel kind of this whiplash of like, I've just sunk into this character and these, this story and this world and this place and I'm already done and I already have to do it all over again where I have to like, okay, where are we now? Who are we now? What's the situation? And you can't like stay in it for that long. You have to like keep doing that over and over and like, where are we now? Where are we now? Where are we now? Um, so that being said, each one pretty much hooked me almost right away, except for Bridget Collins, <laughs> and, and kept me hooked until I finished the story. And yeah, every story basically. Um, so I know this is the second collection they did. Um, I wasn't aware of this until this book. So unfortunately the, the stunning like special edition of the first collection they did, which is The Haunting Season, I think, um, is like long since sold out, but it is still available for purchase in, in paperback. So I'll probably get that. It won't be as pretty as this one, but you know. Anyway, I highly recommend this collection. They are Christmas stories, but only pretty much insofar as like each of them takes place on or around Christmas. Almost none of the stories, almost none, have much to do with Christmas. Mostly it's just like when they are happening. So Christmas is like in the background or like the reason the family members are together is because it's Christmas. So like they're all in the same house right now, but it's not like about Christmas. Um, so you could read it in January or just get it now and read it next December. It's so good. Next was a book that I almost got rid of before reading it. And then I'm so, so relieved and glad that I didn't. And that is Other Birds by Sarah Addison Allen, which I got from Book of the Month. And I didn't read it in the month that I got it. And then it had been months and months and months and I still hadn't read it. And the, li the library did not have the audiobook for it, which is usually how I get through books that I'm like not that excited about. I'm like, oh, let me just get the audio from the library. And at some point, you know, in the car or something, I'll listen to it. And I was like, I have to sit down and actually read this book. And I was like, okay, fine. Well, I'll give it a go. And if I don't like it, then I can get rid of it. Like at least try it before getting rid of it. And I loved it so much. And it made me go and buy the author's backlist. It was also like the bright time to reading it. So it was just as well that I'd waited because the book has a kind of summery vibe and I read it in summer and it takes place kind of, I think, it, I forget, I think it's on an island. Or if not an island, it's certainly like um, a coastal area. And there's, it's a small town and there's like, there's a mystery and there's like, it's kind of magical realism. And there's, it's like, it's warm and charming and also kind of chilling and unsettling at times and, and mysterious. And there's, because it's like summertime and, and, and like Oceanside and this place, it, they, they, Marshmallow grows there. So they're famous for their marshmallow candy made with the marshmallow that grows there. I lit like a marshmallow scented candle and sat, you know, for the long summer evenings reading this. And it was just like the perfect time for it. It just hit the spot. It's exactly what I was needing and craving. And again, I went and bought the other author's backlist, have not read those books, but I loved this so very, very much. Um, it was just, it was just perfect. Um, so yeah. Next is a book that was in my priorities vlog. They weren't all 
horrible. Uh, and that was The Secret Commonwealth, a book two of the Book of Dust by Philip Pullman. Um, with this, again, there was a, a thing in it that I called out as like, I, I don't know why this is here. I don't know why this is necessary. This is kind of weird. But aside from that, really, I was kind of surprised by how very, very much I liked The Secret Commonwealth. I really enjoyed the La Belle Sauvage, the first book, but The Secret Commonwealth, I really, really, really liked. Um, and for this being like a spin-off prequel sequel situation, that doesn't ever sound promising. It's like almost always a bad idea to do something like that. You know, like coming back to a story that you already finished, it's like, but why? Is it necessary? Um, and Abercrombie and Pierce Brown and now Philip Pullman have proved that like they, it was a good idea. Uh, it's not always a bad idea. So yeah, um, I love the world that this takes place in. I like following these characters when they're a little bit older. It follows up on some of the themes of his dark materials in a way that um, continues so, like the characters have matured and so these themes have matured with them and have there are new questions to be asked about the implications of some of the situations set up by his dark materials and I think it's just handled so well and so interestingly and so immersively and I really really want him to finish the book of dust <laughs> I really want to read the next book so um, if you read his dark materials and had um, reservations similar to what I alluded to you might have in, in reading the Book of Dust, you're like, well, do we need a spinoff? I think it's very good. In some respects, the Book of Dust, I think is, you know, not wholly, but it, again, in some respects, I think is better than his Dark Materials. We haven't seen the conclusion yet. Maybe he fumbles the landing. But so far, La Belle Sauvage and Secret Commonwealth, well worth the read. Another super recent um, read, and not as recent as Winter Spirits, but pretty recent, is Starling House by Alex E. Harrow, which I also got from Book of the Month. This is not the Book of the Month Club edition. After I finished it, I went and got the Barnes & Noble special edition because I wanted a nicer copy. But the Book of the Month Club editions, you know, they all have the little Book of the Month Club thing and they're all as like stripped down and bare bones as possible, which is why they can be so cheap, which is nice for like books that I don't care that much about, but this one I wanted to own a nice, nice copy of. I actually sent my Book of the Month Club edition to someone that I was talking to about the book and I was like, I have an extra copy that I'm probably just gonna sell on Pango. Like, do you want it? And they were like, okay. <laughs> so I don't have that copy anymore. But yeah, this is um, kind of like other birds in that like I kind of got it from Book of the Month and was like, ah, I might like it, I don't know. Um, and I did read it like pretty immediately. It wasn't, wasn't like months and months, but I didn't have any particularly high hopes for it. I wasn't like gagging to read it or anything. I read it because I got it from Book of the Month and it was like, it sounded like good enough. <laughs> And I devoured this, love this. And the best read alike I can give for it is that this feels like The Raven Cycle by Maggie Stiefvater for grownups, both because the characters are more adult and also because like the themes and the way the story unfolds and the things in it are a little bit more adult. But like the way it's written, like the style of the prose and then also the kind of like magical realism, nature creepy, haunting gothicness. <laughs> of everything really reminds me of The Raven Cycle. So if you like The Raven Cycle and in general enjoy Maggie Steve Otter's writing, then I highly recommend Starling House. And if you really enjoyed Starling House and have not read The Raven Cycle, then I also recommend you read The Raven Cycle. And last but certainly not least is another book from my priorities project, Demon Voices by Philip Pullman. I kind of went on and on and on about this in the priorities vlog. And so yeah, I, I kind of said all there is, well, I shouldn't say all there is to say. I shouldn't say a ton because I just kept yammering on and on and on and on. And I I love this collection so very much. And I guess I, part of why I yammered on and on and on is because Philip Pullman's positions on certain controversial topics is controversial. <laughs> and I don't want that to put people off from reading this collection because I, th I mean, I was, I guess, belaboring the point in the in that clip. I don't think that you need to agree with everything Philip Pullman thinks or says to read this book or to enjoy this book, because I certainly don't agree with everything that Philip Pullman thinks or says. But I love this book, and I loved engaging with the ideas as presented and discussed by Philip Pullman. Even if I have a different conclusion or perspective, like reading his was an invitation to consider these things for myself and to ask myself, what do I think about this? So yeah, in terms of his his positions on writing craft and on reading craft and on um, different mediums for storytelling and on children's literature versus adult literature, on speculative fiction and what it is or should be, <laughs> and more strictly philosophical topics, you know, the nature of religion, the nature of organized religion, the nature of faith and belief, the nature of science versus belief. Like there's lots in here and lots lots of food for thought. And that's how I regard this book as just a feast for thought. So yeah, 
highly recommend. Um, the books that I are my worst of the year, I do not have a stack. I own some of them physically still, possibly the majority. I don't know, but I don't have them all because I tend to get rid of books that I don't like. So I wasn't gonna have a partial stack. Just no stack at all. Actually, I think I might own all of the books. Like I might actually be able to hold. No, 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 I am missing at least one. <laughs> Again, in no particular order. Um, so first, just on the list is Shark Heart. Oh, I didn't write any author's names down. So the image that presumably I have put here shows you who the author is. Shark Heart was awful. Um, a lot of, the, well, I shouldn't say a lot. One, two, four books are from Book of the Month, which I did cancel. I think I mentioned it in a previous video. No more Book of the Month club for me. Anyway, Shark Heart um, was a ridiculous premise, but a, a premise that had the potential to, if done right, kind of like, you know, say something quite worthwhile or be quite brilliant. Um, despite being kind of bizarre. Oftentimes the most brilliant books take a bizarre idea and just like handle it really well. But it handled it poorly and it didn't seem to know why it had chosen this ridiculous premise, like what exactly it wanted to do, like what was the purpose of this metaphor. If you're not familiar, Shark Heart is about this couple where uh, early in their marriage or just before they get married, but regardless it's a young couple, um, one of them gets diagnosed with turning into a shark, which is a, I guess not a terminal condition, but it is an irreversible condition. And I feel like you could really write something that was like poignant and heartwarming while being ridiculous, and that that book wasn't it. <sighs> it was really long, and it, and for being what you would imagine, like a really character-driven story, because that's gonna have, be kind of how that has to work, um, it's not very, like, the character work is not good or well done, and this whole like here and there, there are these kind of like obvious scenes where like it's really obvious what this whole shark disease thing is a metaphor for, but so much of the world building is not thought through. Um, and if the story had been told more fable-like, perhaps that would work, but the story does actually like bring into it, you know, like government policies regarding how people who have these conditions should be treated. Um, so it like invites you to question how the world actually works, where this kind of a condition is a, is a possibility and has not fully thought through the implications of how it has set up its world building. So it's just badly thought out, badly done, badly executed. So yeah, and it's a slog to get through. Uh, next on my list is a book that I originally intended to do a full review for and then it had been too long and now it's definitely been too long. But I ran into my patrons about it while I was reading it. Uh, and that's Immortal Longings by Chloe Gong and I am done with trying Chloe Gong. This was sold as a Antony and Cleopatra retelling. Um, it has very little to do with Antony and Cleo Cleopatra. Um, I heard some people saying, well, that's kind of like a, that's misleading in the marketing and for how, like, sure, fair, fair enough. Um, and if it was a great story, um, then I would be happy to be like, well, I wouldn't, I don't know how much of a retelling it is, but it's a great book on its own. Uh, it's not a great book on its own. It's a terrible book. The, it's written like YA. This is her first adult book, but like with so many, unfortunately, books that are like a YA author's first foray into adult writing, it's like, but this isn't any different from what you usually write. The only difference is that the characters are older. So if you're not going to write any different, like why? <laughs> why not just keep writing YA? Uh, this isn't, you haven't changed anything. Um, so the writing is extremely juvenile and, and silly and the world building is terrible, characterization is awful. It's just awful. The prose is frankly atrocious. So yeah, um, it was, yeah, it was terrible. Uh, number three on my list, I was like looking at this list and going, did I read that this year? And I did, but it was in January. So it feels like it barely counts. That is The Winter King by Bernard Cornwall, which was a big disappointment. I have a quite lengthy, well, lengthy-ish review on Goodreads for it. Um, I hated this book so very much. I still want to read more Bernard Cornwall, not the rest of the Arthur series, though I do own those books. Um, definitely not that. But um, his Viking books and the Sharp books, I do still want to read those. But The Winter King was terrible and so many baffling choices in terms of the perspective of who's telling it and how we're telling it and what we're what we're trying to do with this Arthur story and the amount of sexual violence that's in it is staggering. It's it's just a miserable read in my opinion and it's so hyped. I it is not for me to say the least. Uh, another book of the month club book Pineapple Street by I forget um, it, after reading it, I learned that the person who wrote it is like somebody from publishing. I think she was like an editor or some kind of an ex exec in publishing. So 
it made a lot more sense to me that this book was published and promoted so much after I learned that because I was like this is not a good book. I don't know who this book is for. It's about like it's like lit fic about like about a bunch of like rich-ish and rich adjacent people but there's like not really a story and it's not it's neither like um tearing down the rich and satirizing them nor is it like trying to make them like relatable and sympathetic it's doing neither somehow so it's just like who is this for what is this for it's not interesting it's not engaging it's not like wow let's like gawk at the ridiculousness of the rich nor is it saying hey the rich are humans too and just because you have a million dollars that doesn't mean, actually a million dollars isn't that much these days, unfortunately, but just because you have millions of dollars doesn't mean that you suddenly stop having like tragedy in your life or things like that. So it, it like, I was like, Whoa. they're just a bunch of vapid, boring people that aren't like, you know, vapid enough for it to be amusing or, or like fascinating to watch them be horrible, nor are they like sympathetic enough for you to actually sympathize with them or care about them or be like, oh, the rich are people too. So it's just like... Why? I do love the cover. Adore the cover. That's probably the only reason I got it. Then number five, um, fittingly, is Five Warrior Angels. I didn't realize I had done that on my list <laughs> until just now. Um, I read the first two books. I didn't want them to take up two slots on this list. Um, so they both share number five. Again, the, they're, these are no particular order. Um, I was reading these for a read-along that we cut short because we were hating the books. We did not want to continue reading the books. We could not imagine that the third book would improve matters. Um, and everything that I, we've heard is that it does very much does not. Five Warrior Angels is too long, for one. Um, extremely heavy-handed with its messaging. The world building is delivered really, really poorly. The characterization is done really badly. The misogyny in it that... Like, the, some of the misogyny in it is, like, the intentional kind of, like, oh, look how evil this person is because, look, they're being a misogynist, which is heavy-handed. But also just, like, the kind of because this world is bad to women, then, like, the author thinks that's an excuse to kind of, like, write about women in dehumanizing ways. And it's, like, no, that's not how that works. Just some baffling descriptions of women. And then like all of these like really unfortunate kind of, um, are they tropes? I don't know, these like I don't know, traps that authors fall into where it's like, well, how do we show that this woman is like, not like other girls, you know, like she's like, let's give her a sword. Or like, um, how do we show that we don't like this girl? Oh, she's like frilly and likes her appearance. And every, every woman's like appearance is described so much more than the appearances of the dudes. I like, guess stuff like that where the author is just telling on himself. Like you can set up a world where in that world women have less rights and that's part of your world building. But just the way you're choosing to describe people and things, the way you're choosing to focus on women's appearances more so than men's and how much that is a focus of the male characters around them as well is really gross to read. And it's really like... A few instances of that here and there where it's like 60-40 in terms of description. It's like, okay, whatever. You know, like you're telling on yourself a bit, but it's whatever. But this is like 80-20 <laughs> and it's just exhausting to read it after a while. It just feels gross and the story isn't good enough for me to like put up with that. It just, there wasn't an upside. So yeah, it was terrible. Uh, next I have The Unmaking of June Farrell by Adrienne Young and I am finally done with Adrienne Young. I keep buying her books and I keep not liking them. She peaked at her first one, The Sky and the Deep, which wasn't great. But for a debut, there was a YA Viking book when no one was doing that. Um, it was good. It was like decent. And every book since then has been worse and worse and worse. And this was not her first adult book. Her first adult book was last year, the year before. Spells for Forgetting, which was very forgettable. And like the reason I keep buying her books is because one, she's a nice person. Like I follow her on social media and I have gone to book signings. Um, where she's been present and she's like I like her as a person like I would want to like get coffee with her and like have her as a neighbor like she's really like a chill person and then the concepts for all of her books they always sound intriguing to me and the cover designs they're always like oh that sounds like a really cool idea for a book but then the execution is always so lackluster to terrible and I'm finally done <laughs> Like, I'm sure that whatever she comes out with next will once again be a premise that sounds intriguing, that sounds like a book I'd be interested in, and will probably have a really cool cover, and I will probably be, um, like, enticed to buy it. But I'm, no, I've never liked her books. The best that it's ever been is me going, well, I'm trash for Vikings, and this was decent, therefore 
I like this fine. That's the best that it's ever been. So I, yeah, I'm finally done. <laughs> no more. I've accepted it. I don't actually think she's a good writer. <laughs> oh yeah, but the, the reasons for unmaking of June Farrow Fer being bad is again, it feels really amateurish for this. This is like what her seventh book or something, if not more. And so the writing itself, amateurish. The story is like, it's it's okay. It sounds again, it's like a, a cool concept, but it's not executed terribly well. The characterization is not done very well. And then there's some like kind of like implications of how it was written that were kind of not great. But I was like, whatever. I, I mean, I don't like this book and that doesn't make it better, but like, whatever. And then her afterward, like drew attention to the fact that she knows exactly why some of those choices might be a little bit questionable, but how because she's like aware of it that makes it better and I was like oh that made it so much worse for you like if reading this me just going kind of like ah uh, it's kind of thoughtless of you to have written it like this but fine whatever and for her to write the afterward to be like yeah no I know actually what I did um I just want you to know that I know um like how is that better <laughs> Um, that was so much worse. And I'm sure she was told to put that there. I'm not necessarily saying that she decided that it would be better to point it out, but whoever decided to point it out, I don't think that did what you thought it would do. Um, then the next three were all in my priorities vlog and I ranted at length about all three. So that's Wolf Hall and The Essex Serpent and Priory of the Orange Tree. Again, I ranted for so long about those that I don't have the energy to rant about them all over again. But suffice to say, Wolf Hall, overrated, terribly written. I don't understand the hype or the awards. She did her research, woo, gold star. Essex Serpent made me livid. <laughs> Awful, terrible characterization. This is not feminism, hate it. And Prior to the Orange Tree, also this is not feminism. This did not need to be 800 pages. This is not how you world build. This is not complexity in politics. This is not how you write good fantasy. And last is Splendid by the author of the Bridgerton books is Julia something, I think. This was a Blaze and Bodice Rippers book club pick. Clearly not my pick. And I hated it so very, very much. It was really, really long. I did not find the romance compelling. I found a lot of the kind of like anachronistic, like supposedly feminist points I was trying to make. Again, not just anachronistic, which always irritates me, but like also not very feminist. Like it ultimately ended up kind of like doing things that made it anti-feminist in some respects and some of the like ways that the hero would like speak and do things and and it was like it was like this isn't romantic that is those are red flags <laughs> um i was not entertained it was not enjoyable and it was in fact quite infuriating um on to then my priorities for 2024 and the stack is yonder so let me go and fetch it <laughs> oh god i'm trapped <laughs> Last year's priority list um, had no rhyme or reason in terms of the number of books. It was just like a stack of books. And this year I decided specifically to choose 12 books so that in theory I could read one a month and, and achieve this goal. Not that I necessarily will structure it that way, but that I could structure it that way and get it done. But I might read them all in January. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. Um, anyway, so that's it's another st uh, stack of books that for one reason or another which I will explain now um I want to get it done that it's yeah <laughs> okay let's do it first and foremost and I do mean foremost is Lightbringer by Pierce Brown which I should have read in 2023 and I still haven't I did start it I did start it I have not finished it and so the read-along lies dead and dormant I, w I will though this is this is priority number one in January this could be number one I will finish Lightbringer because, because I need to. Uh, next up is a book that has not been, you know, around for very long on my TBR at all, at all, at all. Um, that is Encyclopedia of Fairies by Heather Fawcett. Um, the main reason for this is because there are other books coming out slash have come just, just either have just come out or are coming out or both. Maybe you think one's a spinoff, one's a sequel. I don't know. There's other books connected to this that intrigue me also and I am very likely to just go out and buy them but I would like to have read this first to know that I like this and if I don't like this well then I'm not going to buy those other books. This was kind of prior to the orange tree like I really wanted the sequel to it because it was so pretty but I was like you haven't even read Priory yet. I mean you haven't finished Priory yet. Now I have and can say for certain that I hate Priory and I would certainly hate the other books so no. 
beautiful, but no. So similar to this, like, I think I might like this, but I don't know that. And I'm not gonna go out and buy all the other books that are also pretty until I know that I like this one. So girly, you better read this this year and read it quick so that you can go buy those other books or not because you hate this. Uh, then I want to read my bo 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 Broken Binding books because the main reason I'm subscribed to Broken Binding is the first law books, everyone is shocked. But there's all these other pretty books that they keep sending me <laughs> and I keep not reading them. So um, I have put The Bone Ships um, on this. Actually, that was part of why The Ninth Rain was on my list this last year um, and I didn't like it. <laughs> so that's that's three gone. Um, so the Bone Ships, I have the whole trilogy from the Broken Binding in these stunning editions. So let's read the first one and see how I like it. If I like it, well then great. Let's read the trilogy and we can be glad to have it. And if not, well then let's get rid of it. <laughs> then um, I keep collecting Natasha Pulley books. There's dust on this because I've had this for forever. This was the first one, so that's why it's on this list. I have owned The Watchmaker of Filigree Street for since it came out. Um, this is probably a first edition. Okay, it's not a first edition. I've, I've owned this basically since it came out because it's pretty and has this like hole in it and is gilded and pretty and I've said pretty like 10 times. And as far as I know, I don't even know that much, is that it's um, either alternate history or like steampunk or like historical fantasy, something like that. And all her books are so pretty and I keep buying them and not reading them. And I need to like actually know if I like them. I think there's a good chance that I would. They all sound great. Then again, Adrian Young's books sound great and they aren't, so. Anyway, um, this was the first one that I ever bought. So I wanna read it and confirm <laughs> if uh, if these are any good. So yeah, Look, looking forward to this. <laughs> uh, the next one, actually the next two, are books that I keep putting on, on buddy read polls for my patrons and they keep not choosing them. So you know what? Screw y'all. I'm not gonna wait for y'all anymore. You don't want to read a message received. I will read them myself and they're probably great and you're missing out. Or they suck. I don't know. We'll find out. But that is A Crown for Cold Silver by Alex Marshall and Heroes Die by Matthew Woodring Stover. Um, I really want to read these and I can't. I'm tired of waiting. <laughs> so I'm just gonna, but then it's also because I tend to only read books that are in, in some way a priority. They're for a project, they're for a buddy read, they're for a read along. Um, which is kind of, I was like, I really want to read these. Well, if I make it a patron buddy read, well, then I have to read it and I want to read it and they know they never choose it. So I'm making it a priority for the priorities project. So now I can read them for that and and y'all are going to miss out. Next is a book that um, one of my patrons raved about and then a different patron got the book for me. <laughs> and that is Illborn by Daniel T. Jackson. I have since heard, this is really heavy. Why is this, on, are these pages like Bible thin pages? Anyway, um, I have since been told that I probably will not like this, but I would like to know for myself and I have it. So if I hate it, well then great, I can sell it. And um, if I love it, well then great. I have a new book to love. This is so heavy, why is it so heavy? Uh, next is a book from a friend that is always complaining that um, she reads the books that I suggest to her, but she never reads, but I never read the books that she suggests to me, which is partly true, but I also just have more obligations than she does in terms of reading. So I'm like, I don't have time. <laughs> anyway, she not only recommended this, re not only recommended this to me, but gave me a copy of The Bone Shard Daughter. So I'll, I'm gonna read it, okay? I'm gonna freaking read a book that you recommended. And you have, <laughs> this friend has since like read the second book or maybe the third book later in the series and is like, ah. Uh, it's actually not that good. I was like, well, you gave me the first one. I said that I have to read it. So I'm reading it. Okay. Okay. Uh, next up, I have Star Sight by Brandon Sanderson because I really, really liked Skyward and I've been very nervous about reading the other books because everyone tells me that I will not like the rest of the series. The fourth and final one just came out. I own them all in the Pretty UK editions and Bookborn tells me that I would probably like Star Sight, possibly even better than Skyward, but that I should stop after that. <laughs> Can't promise I'll stop after that because I do own them all, but um, all right, I will read Star Sight and we'll see if I like it better than Skyward. Uh, the next one, I just own so many copies of this. Um, Ink Blood Sister Scribe. I feel like I heard nothing but like excitement and praise and then nothing since. So it like, it like, like a firework and then disappeared. I don't know, but I own so many copies of this. Um, I own, I don't even know which one is this. This is the Water Sounds edition, which my friend kindly got for me. I also have the Illumicrate edition and I have another edition. 
Yeah. Anyway, um, I have so many freaking copies of this book. And it did almost win the Buddy Read poll. It was like so close to winning. So then I put it on the next month and the next month after that. And it, it's like barely anyone's voting for it. And I was like, again, with the whole everyone was hyped for it. And then it just like disappeared. Including on my Patreon. <laughs> I don't know. I own a bunch. So I want to know if I like this or if I should get rid of all these pretty books. Because they are really, really pretty. I mean, tell me this isn't stunning. Is the naked cover stunning? No. But it's... It's fine. Anyway, yeah, that's the reason for this. Um, then the next book, I've owned this for forever, ever. Actually, I haven't owned this for forever, ever, ever. Um, I have owned this trilogy for a really long time. And I had like the little, little, uh, the UK paperback size um, for the first one. And then this bigger size for the second and third ones. And for the life of me, I could not find a first book that was like this size. And I finally did. And now I have... I have the little size all matching all three and then I have the little size matching all three that are like with signed book plates and I also have these big ones and so I think I have two and a half or three complete sets of this trilogy and I've not read a single one and I love the covers of these books that's mainly why I have them anyway um yeah I should read these since I own so many copies of them I've been told that I'll probably hate this which I guess we'll see won't we? Um, but I'm excited to have the big floppy one to read instead of the tiny one. So yay for that. And I hope I like it because the covers are so pretty. And I love Guns at the Dawn. So uh, and I liked Children of Time. Didn't love it. So Adrian Tchaikovsky is an author that I have enjoyed. So fingers crossed. And last and possibly least, oh my god, I still have a sticky note in here from like three years ago when I was like trying to be like, read half one day and half the next day. Here's a sticky note to mark your place. I used to do that more. Gods of Jade and Shadow by Sylvia Moreno-Garcia. I got it from Book of the Month and I've put this on so many TBRs and I've put it on buddy read polls and I've like tried to like find a reason to read it and I keep not reading it and I need to freaking read this book. July 2019 is when I got this. I'm tired of looking at it. I've heard a lot of people say they love it and I've heard a lot of people say they hate it and I just want it to be done. Maybe this is my new favorite book ever, which would be fantastic. Or it's not. Either way, I just need to know and move on. And that is that. 2023 is done and we're ready to start 2024 by reading some of these books. <laughs> Let me know in the comments down below your plans for the year. If you have read any of the books on my to read list, um, predictions for how I'll feel about them. Whatever you want to let me know. I post videos, period. <laughs> happy New Year. Uh, happy to have you here. Checking out my videos if and when I post them. And yeah, I'll chat with you soon in another video, presumably. <laughs> Bye.